Lesson 15. The creative power of the concentrated thought is the beginning and the end of all constructive mental activity. It marks the borderline between abstract concepts and their embodiment in concrete, living facts. Most people, especially the so-called mental types, do not possess the creative powers strongly enough to bring down to the material plane their abstract concepts. Their thought is sterile, because they themselves are empty of the constructive energy from which mind as well as body must draw its positive force. Consequently they are as impotent to attract on the physical plane the opportunity to realize their concepts as they are physically incapable of taking advantage of it. Thought, in order to be creative, must live. Just as the body of a newborn child, with all its undeveloped possibilities for growth and unfoldment, must have within it some center of animating power which will drive those possibilities into expression, so your thought must contact some secret spring of action which will invest the listless form with life and make it an active instrument for the accomplishment of its design. The cold ray of your mind cannot impart to your concepts this vital current, any more than the cold light of the moon can stir a seed into growth. It can project, like shadows, the ideas which float past the lens of your conscious self, but the only living principle which can implant in those shadows the germ of life and make them real independent, magnetic entities of some consequence in the scheme of things is the one common source of all animate being, universal life energy. Mental concepts become creative in direct proportion to the amount of universal life energy with which you endow them. The more life force you pour into your concentrated thought, the greater power of attraction that thought will be able to exert in order to draw to it the very elements for its realization on the material plane. From mere aimless spectres drifting across your mental firmament, your concepts become fixed units of dynamic energy, thrusting out capable, searching fingers into the passing stream of events. They enter actively into the current of your life and work constructively to mold circumstances to your advantage. Obviously, in business and in human relations in general, the individual with the strong creative thought is the one who wins. His idea is the magnetic center about which cluster the thoughts and interests of others whom he enables to see the same possibilities through his own mental eye. As the host of that attractive concept, he becomes the focal center, the point through which it is to be thrust out into realization, and is naturally in the position of leadership. Very frequently this normal crystallization of circumstances about one individual is attributed to suggestion or persuasion, but after all it is nothing but the natural response of less energetic minds to the stronger radioactivity of another. Therefore whenever you concentrate your mind upon some object to be achieved, use universal life energy to impregnate thoroughly the inner image conjured up by your conscious self. Your thought, so permeated, becomes actually a living thing, a seed which, wherever planted, will grow and produce a lasting impression. This is the secret of why the thoughts of some people impress, while those of others do not. Mental Concepts to strike with conviction, must be driven forward by that impelling force, which can be injected into them as follows. Relax, enter into silence and make the contact with universal life energy. Then, when you feel its current flowing through you, concentrate your mind on the object you are interested in achieving. Let that power pour strongly through your thought channels to the support of your mental activity, so that it etches out on the screen of your consciousness a picture so vivid and distinct in every detail that you can actually visualize it. Once you have brought your concept into clear focus, do not project it from yourself as if to impress others, but discharge it instead into your own subconsciousness according to the method described in Lesson 12 for learning things by heart. Remember, you are working now with a power which functions only when relaxation provides it with adequate channels, and your purpose is to attract, not compel, the opportunity you desire. If you indulge the temptation to use your will at this point you automatically close the channels within you and shift your reliance from the unlimited energy of the universe to the very limited and undependable powers of your own mind. When your concentrated thought, charged with universal life energy, is allowed to sink into your inner self, it is conveyed from the brain along the spinal cord to the solar plexus, where it produces an impression upon the subconsciousness. This initial impression is only the first step in a mental campaign to bring about its realization in fact. It blazes a neutral trail, so to speak, between itself as the magnetic nucleus at one end and your conscious self at the other. 
Therefore by repeating this process day by day at a certain time selected for that purpose you pour over the connecting line within you an increasing torrent of life force which stamps the image continually deeper in your subconscious field and radiates from it an ever more powerful stream. The result of all this will be that your concentrated thought, like an electric magnet fed by a stronger and stronger current, will gradually extend the field of its influence so that it contacts and draws within reach all the corresponding elements for its actual embodiment in material expression. Environment and conditions will subtly modify themselves in response to the insistent pressure put upon them, and will eventually open a way for the birth in accomplished fact of that inner concept working through you. Yet the creative thought itself, although it can produce the right combination of circumstances, cannot proceed further by its own initiative. Its function is completed when it has brought within your reach the opportunity to realize it on the plane of matter. It cannot skip from the abstract into the concrete without any intermediary process, any more than you can think a $10 gold piece into your pocket. You can think of a way to earn a $10 gold piece, but between you and your possession of it stands a barrier which you cannot dodge or jump, work. Work is the activity of giving physical birth to a mental concept. It consists of welding the elements and circumstances attracted by the concept into its image and likeness on the material plane. The thought of a building is habitable only when it is erected in brick and stone. The thought of a bridge will carry you dry shod across a river only when it is wrought in steel and iron. The thought of a political speech will sway a nation only when outlined in sound or ink. The individual, therefore, has two opposite shores to his nature from which he must build out simultaneously in order to span the gap between. On the mental shore stands the concept demanding expression, on the physical shore stands his own body. The warm sun of universal life energy, shining equally on both, expresses itself through the concept in a magnetic and harmonizing power which flings out to midstream a semi-arch of opportunity. Through the body it emerges as constructive activities which go out to meet that waiting opportunity. The two are joined in the middle, and the keystone of the entire structure is work. From this will be perceived the fallacy of depending on either the mental or the physical plane alone for the attainment of ambitions. Those who believe that by desiring a thing strongly they can obtain it without any physical effort whatever are doomed to certain failure. Also those who strive valiantly but without intelligence can never gain any appreciable headway. Achievement and progress result only from a proper combination and cooperation of the two. All the obstacles and difficulties which hinder this fruitful cooperation come from a lack on one plane or the other, or both, of universal life energy. The body is an alert and responsive tool of the mind only as it is animated with an abundant current of life force. The mind is able to wield that tool easily only as the same power endows it with the capacity to do so. Lack of physical vitality makes the individual a weak and ailing victim of all negative influences. Lack of vitality on the mental plane generates most of the negative influences of which he is the victim. Characteristic of these are timidity, indecision, procrastination and all associated weaknesses. All are in effect merely the flabby yielding of an enervated mind to the force of circumstances, and all are comprehended in the single term, fear. As stated in Lesson 12, Fear is a feeling of helplessness or lack of power in the face of adverse conditions. Therefore it is the fundamental cause of the specific symptoms now under consideration. The cure for these symptoms naturally lies in the cure of their cause. Those who know how to contact an abundant supply of universal life energy are never cowed by any situation which confronts them. They possess a poise which nothing can disturb and which they obtained not as the result of a laborious and complicated process of bolstering up the weak places one by one, but through a sweeping elimination of all together. There is no room in them for fear, because there is no inner vacuum from which it can exert its paralyzing pressure. Occasionally a superabundance of energy may impel one to jump at conclusions and perhaps come to a wrong decision. The upward surge of vital force through every available channel is so strong that it must burst into expression one way or the other. The individual, far from hesitating, is literally driven into taking a decision which the outcome may give him reason for regret. Such circumstance is an error on the positive side, yet is infinitely preferable to the negative course of avoiding any decision at all. Failure to decide means inertia, a condition as barren of results and as unsusceptible of change as death itself. Any activity, 
even though wrongly directed, is better than that, because not only will mistaken action be in any event an instructive experience, but it is always subject to modification from wrong into right. The reason why even this somewhat excusable error is less common than the greater crime of inertia is because of the most subtle and pervasive of the three negative influences previously mentioned, procrastination. This is a sort of mental safety valve through which any surplus steam you might generate leaks away unused. It means putting things off until some future time when, supposedly, you will be better qualified to do them. Tomorrow is its watchword, and tomorrow, as everyone knows but seldom bothers to admit, never arrives. Neither does the decision. Therefore whenever you are confronted with a task to which you think you are not equal at the moment, that is a challenge which you cannot afford to ignore. Make the mental contact with universal life energy and proceed to master the situation without further delay, because if you yield to the temptation to put it off you are beaten before you know it. You have at your command ample power through which to assert once and for all your dominance, yet if you fail to make use of it when the time is ripe you will find it increasingly difficult to gain victory later. Much is written and taught today of the power of suggestion as a means for overcoming not these limitations, but all others of a physical and emotional nature as well. Therefore suggestion deserves a critical analysis from the point of view of the knowledge imparted to you in these lessons, and as a result of that analysis should henceforth be left severally alone. In the first place, suggestion is a purely mental exercise, and is therefore subject to the same limitations and disadvantages as mind itself, and in the same degree. The instrument through which it works is the human will, and it is strong or weak in proportion as the will is strong or weak. As a cure for ailments which result from the weakness of the same mind on whose strength it must depend for its own efficacy it is therefore totally inadequate, yet as a temporary alleviation it is sometimes as miraculously effective, and as dangerous, as a powerful drug. Suggestion consists of the imposition of one mind upon another through the force of the will. Auto-suggestion is the same process applied to one's own subconsciousness by his conscious self. Both are mild forms respectively of hypnosis and self-hypnosis. The mechanics of their operation is through affirmation or repetition, whereby the desired thought is pounded into the subconsciousness of the individual until he automatically reacts to it. The singularly vicious and destructive nature of this process is apparent when you consider that it completely paralyzes the department of mind through which every individual achieves his own independent expression, the conscious self. That is, it robs one of his own identity and implants in him a false one fashioned in accordance with the desire of the operator. Instead of disclosing as through a clear glass the true inner individuality which is himself, the victim reflects like a mirror the false image flung there by someone else. He is no longer a free, self-reliant entity, author of the particular destiny that is his, but is a mechanical puppet jerked by the strings of another person's promptings to do that other person's will. Your whole independent existence hinges upon the three conscious guardians of your subconscious mental field, reason, will, and common sense. When your rational mind rebels against the intrusion of alien ideas, those ideas are jammed past the opposition of your will by the stronger and more determined will of the operator. Your defenses are broken down, and instead of you planting the seeds of your own activities in your subconscious soil, the other individual plants the seeds of activities conceived by him. In other words, through the unguarded door of your mind he sows the crop that you will grow and reap for him in your life. Therefore of all moral offenses suggestion is one of the worst, because it robs people of their most valuable rights, personal freedom and self-determination. Yet unconsciously it is employed all the time throughout the whole structure of human relations, and is even deliberately urged as a desirable means to achieve your ends. You can probably pick out of your own experience numerous instances where you have succumbed against your will to the stronger mental influences of another. Often you have done things which you otherwise would have refrained from doing, and afterward have hated both the other individual for putting forth the suggestion and yourself for yielding to it. Your supreme interest should be always to preserve your mental freedom. Station your conscious faculties, forewarned with knowledge and forearmed with abundant life force securely at the door to your subconscious self, ready to bar from entry every thought which your reason condemns as unfit. This does not mean to develop an antagonistic and suspicious attitude, which is simply a cleverly disguised form of fear and betrays you into the very condition you wish to avoid. 
Everything has a right to demand an audience with your rational mind, but your rational mind must have the poise and discrimination to estimate truly its value or fitness to obtain admission. Only by exercising that power of discrimination can you bring forth its associate's activity of self-determination, thereby establishing the moral independence which is your right. The more you use and strengthen these conscious servants of yours, the broader and freer you will become mentally, and the more efficient and powerful you will be in life. Auto-suggestion has effects quite as undesirable as suggestion itself, and its continual practice is bound to reduce very materially the efficiency of the individual. Repeated affirmations which do not bear fruit in realization by the conscious self eventually deaden the subconsciousness, just as an incessant series of blows will numb into insensibility any portion of your body. The cumulative effect of that persistent hammering, always falling in monotonous repetitions on the same spot, is far more destructive than one severe shock which would stun, but not kill. This effect is very noticeable in those who have become confirmed addicts to this mental drug. It is a well-known fact that subjects of suggestion or auto-suggestion are mentally sluggish and lacking in the buoyant alertness of a healthy and normal mind. Dependent as they are on that unnatural stimulant, they require an increasingly powerful dose of it each time in order to react at all. The dose they take may flog them into temporary activity, but it also flogs out of them a measure of the strength and resistance they have left. That is why suggestion invariably fails to effect a permanent cure of physical or mental ailments. It feeds on the energy of the individual, so that as it gets stronger and more pronounced in its reaction, the individual himself gets weaker and less resistant to the trouble which he is trying to cure. Thus every convalescence induced in this way is merely an easy stepping stone down into the grave. Clearly, therefore, positive suggestion can never actually eliminate a trouble of any sort. It can suppress a negative condition by laying over it a thin shell of positive statements, but that negative condition, like water under ice, will grow in power as it is fed by the springs of evil below. Soon or late it will burst in a turbulent flood through the wall that can no longer restrain it and will spread its accumulated poison throughout the life of the individual. Sometimes this process may take years to come to a head, but the penalty it will exact for the delay will be great in proportion. Evil not eliminated is evil growing in strength a magnetic center of disturbance into which pours all negative matter of a similar nature. In the end it must break out, the more acute as it has been longer postponed. It would be much better to take troubles as they come and let them run their course as they trickle into your life than to build a barrier behind which they can collect and pile up affliction for you. Suggestion and auto-suggestion, therefore, are both superficial and dangerous. Sometimes, especially with weak characters, they produce instant and seemingly miraculous results, yet those results are very temporary and bought at a heavy price. But through scientific mental methods, which are based on the eternal fact of mankind's fundamental perfection and possession of all powers and qualities, though usually in a dormant condition, the genuine permanent cures of which these interesting tricks of the mind can conjure up the appearance, can be obtained. Every human being is endowed from birth with the full measure of strength, wisdom, health, wealth, success, and happiness. They are ingredients of that perfection to which your life is dedicated. But in order to bring them out you must first realize their existence as inherent powers within yourself, and then take logical steps to transmute them into actual accomplished fact in your life. Creation of something new, in the literal sense of the word, is not within the power of any human being. You can alter the arrangement of existing things in a way that will react to your own advantage, and unite them in any new combination your ingenuity may devise, but you cannot add one atom to the material cosmos. It is already complete and perfect. Similarly, by developing your inner qualities and powers you uncover more and more of the perfection within you, thereby obtaining a better perspective and a broader view of the material world in which you live. The possibilities you are able to see, and the use you are able to make of them, will be determined by the corresponding degree of development and unfoldment in you. Your problem is therefore to thrust back the curtain of human limitations which hides from you all but a small section of your inner perfection. Those limitations are human products, manufactured out of perversions of the truth by your human mind, and are self-imposed negative restrictions. Yet no negative can withstand the invincible strength of truth and its pure essence as an aspect of universal life energy.
Use universal life energy in realizing the boundless wealth of qualities within you, and send into them the vitalizing current of that positive force. Let it pierce the veil of negative behind which they slumber, startling them into life and sweeping them into an irresistible natural development which nothing can stop. With that power surging up within, pouring into an ever more abundant expression through the qualities it awakens, you are borne forward over every barrier to that great heritage which is yours from eternity, as it is the heritage of every mortal being. You, like everyone else, are at present the victim of a gigantic conspiracy built up by humanity against itself from the very beginning. That conspiracy, the first evil fruit of mind, is the suggestion that you are a creature apart, that you are separated from the inner perfection which is in reality yours and that your salvation now lies through mind alone. The whole environment into which every generation is born is rid with this erroneous belief, so that they conform to it as to a mold and accept it as an established truth. Thus they rob themselves of the very qualities and powers which only a free and natural development can unfold. As the whole limited state of mankind is therefore due to that one false suggestion, obviously you cannot hope to win release from it by clouding your intelligence with further suggestions. It is necessary to get rid of that initial suggestion in the first place, and stay clear of any new ones in the second. Complete mental freedom and liberation from all kinds of evil can be achieved only if suggestion in all its forms is completely avoided. Universal life energy, freely used and intelligently directed, is the sole power which can and will bring into realization in your life the boundless fund of hoarded possibilities within you. Abandon mental narcotics which, while they stimulate for the moment, sap your strength and betray you to certain defeat and disillusionment. To rely on suggestion is to rely on your fallible human mind, to rely on universal life energy is to rely on a power to which mind is subservient, and which does not permit error. A positive suggestion can be negatived by a counter-suggestion which will cut away the ground from under you and leave you bereft of whatever results you may have obtained. But any constructive achievement, any positive result obtained through the use of universal life energy is permanent and impregnable to the assaults of any negative, because it is sustained by the one supreme and positive power which governs all. Exercises The regular performance morning and evening of the star exercise, relaxation, and silence, together with the continual contact with universal life energy and concentration, will comprise the basic preparatory activity which will be poured into the channel of the new exercise for this week, visualization. Visualization is the process of so emphasizing the particular object of your concentrated thought that it glows richly out into a convincing semblance of reality upon your mental vision. From a transparent and ghostly outline it must condense into a clear, full image distinct in every detail and warm with a lustrous fund of abundant life, which burns it into your consciousness like a thing of fire. In order to visualize, proceed as follows, after concentrating your mind upon the particular object or design which you wish to realize, try to construct it in your thought so that you actually see it with your mental eye. Bring it into focus so clearly that it becomes distinct and vivid in every detail. Etch it out on your consciousness with such precision that you could describe it in all its particulars. You must perceive it mentally with an exactitude no less striking than that which characterizes a tree seen in winter against the pale disk of the moon. Each twig stands out stark and black across the white field which illumines it, asserting its peculiar identity just as each item of your concept must assert its own on the shimmering screen of your conscious self. This singular clarity of mental vision, in which the individual parts stand out boldly without detracting from the harmonious strength of the whole, is absolutely essential for proper visualization. The universal life energy poured into this work will not only wash into vivid relief your mental concepts, but it will also help you to perform a further function in that connection. You must make this concept live. See it in its brightest and strongest colors, not as perhaps it would be in reality, but as it could be. Caught extremes in your imaginative process, and invest that inner image with an abounding vitality that bursts from every feature in a warmly diffused radiance, like light from a burning ember. Then you will be ready to start it on the next step of its journey into material realization with every assurance of complete success. In visualization there is no limitation to objects merely of a visible, tangible nature. The abstract details of a mental work, such as the policy of a business organization or the plot of a story to be written, are just as subject to that process as is the concept of a marble statue in the mind of a sculptor. 
His goal is the same, although the materials he works with are of a more solid nature. With hand and chisel he has to reproduce in clay and rock the image in his fancy. With words and ink the businessman has to mold events to the shape he perceives as desirable. In both the single aim is expression, and though the materials each works with are different, the process of modifying them is essentially the same. Those whose tasks lie in the realm of thought are really less limited than those whose vocations confine them to physical mediums of expression. In mind there is infinite variety, unfettered by rarity or price, bounded only by the elastic borders of imagination. Ideas do not have to be crammed within the confines of the material scale, but cover the whole unexplored area of mental as well as physical fields. They are the most plastic and subtle of all the clays from which mind fashions its ends, instant to change and adapt themselves to the infinity of combinations that need may demand or ingenuity suggest. Universal life energy, all pervading and omnipotent, will snatch from the unfathomed depths of universal consciousness the mental materials you may require just as effectively as it will attract on the physical plane the elements for the realization of desires. Being an intelligent as well as an energetic power, it will not only invigorate you in the act of transmuting thoughts into fact, but it will reveal to you the best way to perform that work. Through universal life energy you will erect a structure of achievement not only imposing in bulk, but nicely coordinated and joined in harmonious proportions that ensure its permanence no less than they enhance its loveliness. The precious and desirable qualities of all things emerge into so pronounced expression at the impulse of this power that the more you use it in your daily activities the more impressively will be borne upon you the recognition of its priceless worth. Questions and Answers to Lesson 15 1. What is Creative Thought? Creative Thought is thought which possesses the constructive energy necessary to attract the elements for its actual realization. 2. How is concentrated thought made creative? The concentrated thought is made creative, by injecting into it universal life energy. 3. On what does the measure of any individual's success largely depend? The measure of any individual's success largely depends, upon the amount of universal life energy he is able to use in the realization of his mental concepts. 4. Are progress and achievement products of the creative thought alone? Progress and achievement, are not products of the creative thought alone. 5. What is the medium through which the creative thought actually embodies itself in material expression? The medium through which the concentrated thought actually embodies itself in material expression is, physical work and effort. 6. What important advantage results from the proper cooperation between mind and body? The important advantage resulting from the proper cooperation between mind and body is, poise. 7. What is the cause of timidity, indecision and procrastination? The cause of timidity, indecision and procrastination is, lack of power, or fear. 8. How can they be eliminated? They can be eliminated, by the use of universal life energy to supply that lack and abolish fear. 9. What is suggestion in its various aspects? Suggestion in its various aspects is, the imposition of one mind upon another through willpower. 10. What is its main effect upon the individual? Its main effect upon the individual is, to deprive him of his most valuable rights independence and self-determination. 11. Are affirmations effective in curing negative conditions? Affirmations, are not effective in curing negative conditions, although for the time they can suppress them. 12. How can mental qualities be best developed? Mental qualities can best be developed, by exercising them, together with the continual use of universal life energy.